Hello and welcome once again to another Marty's Matchbox Makeovers. Today I am doing a truck, it's a major pack number M4. It's called the Fruhoff Hopper Train and the M4 version was made between 1965 and 1966. Now I've had this model for quite a while but I was unable to complete it because it comes with two hoppers and I only had the one and I, I can't remember who donated it. It was probably early on in the piece because I have no recollection and I haven't put a sticker on this one. If you know who donated it, please let me know and I'll, I'll include their name in the description. Anyway, just last week I got from Paul Sims in Wales the second rear hopper that I needed to start on this restoration. So that's what I'm doing. If it wasn't for Paul, this thing would still be sitting on the shelf in my to-do section. So here's uh, just a look at the thing. As you can see, it's got average paint on it showing a lot of signs of wear and tear obviously well played with in the sand pit by some young child the hoppers have two synchronized doors at the bottom to let the product spill out whenever it's required they're quite ingenious how they uh, they mate together and you move one and the other one moves the rear section's got a tow bar on it and the front section's only got four wheels the rear section has got eight wheels and I'm going to start pulling this apart I'm going to remove all the tires and wheels from the from the model there's a lot of tires on this model it's got a total of 18 wheels or 19 if you include the spare so I'm using my cylindrical grindstone as per normal in my videos to remove the burr off the end of the axle there so I can remove the axle and remove those red wheel hubs for cleaning Quite easy. I know this, this one has an imperfection in it, probably came from the factory like that. So when I put it back together, I've got to remember to put any wheels like that with damage or imperfections. I've got to put them on the inside so they're not seen when the model's on display. So that was the rear wheels, now the front. Again, quite a simple operation. I used to stuff around putting the thing in the vise, and, but I've kind of gained enough confidence over the last couple of years that I now just hold it in my hand to do this little job. I'm going to drill that rivet out at the back and put this thing back together at the end with this tiny little M2 screw. I'll just show you the diameter of the threaded portion on these. You'd think it would be 2mm but my micrometer says it's 1.9. So I'm going to drill out the hole uh, with a 1.5mm drill. And this will leave enough material in the hole for me to cut a screw thread to put that screw in. If I used a bigger drill, you see, I wouldn't be able to use that, that screw. I'd have to glue it in. So once I've drilled the centre hole, I now remove the large head off of the, the base rivet using a larger or suitably sized drill. And just prise it apart with a small flat bladed screwdriver like that. And the front of this model is held in place by a tab that goes into a slot on the front of the bumper bar. That blue plastic piece there is a, an attempt at Matchbox to make some realistic suspension, but they weren't that good, but they served the purpose, so I'll be putting that back in. Now, the reason I took the base off, uh, not only was to take the base off to paint it, but it's also given me access to the windscreen which is a little bit scuffed up and unless you take these out and give them a good polish the end product never looks any good it's kind of uh, like if you've got a little dent on your car you know you can't stop looking at it well when these models are back together if the windscreen's a little bit scuffed up or worn you just keep looking at it and you think mm, should have spent a little bit of extra time there and polished it up so that's what I'm doing anyway having removed the base it now reveals how that spare wheel is held in place and it's simply just hammered into position um, the the tiny little stub axle there that the spare wheel sits on it's basically like a tiny nail and you'll see when I pull it out that the end of it is uh, has been ground down to a sharp point 
Now, it obviously worked because it's still there. I mean, these days it wouldn't be allowed just in case it fell off and got swallowed by a child. But of course, times have changed and these are 50 year old models, don't forget. So having drilled out that hole initially, I'm now taking it down to the correct depth using that paper tape wrapped around the drill as a guide so I don't go too deep. Now I'm demonstrating here that you don't need to get yourself a screw thread tap if you can't afford one. You can sometimes, as in this case, get away with simply cutting the thread with a screw. So long as you cut the hole to the correct size so you haven't got too much uh, pressure building up in there because you could split that tubing open. As long as you've got the right size hole and a small enough screw you can basically screw it in using some pliers and it will cut its own thread. So there's a little tip you could try out. Now this one was slightly too long because it's quite shallow the base on this model. So uh, as a precaution I'm just cutting it down slightly so that there's no possibility of it bottoming out bottoming bottom bottom minging <laughs> bottom minging there's no risk of it not sitting fully flush so that's nice that when the base is back on it's going to look good i know this the rear trailer has a little plastic eyelet there which is unusual because i would have thought it would have been pulled off and thrown away by some kid because it came out very very easily and I can't believe it was still there. So yeah, I've taken the wheels off the cab and now I'm going to take all the wheels off of the trailers. Uh, I should have flipped this over so you could see what was going on. But I wasn't concentrating. This axle's slightly bent, so I've got to straighten that. When they're bent like that, it makes it difficult to grind off the end evenly sometimes. This one wasn't too bad, but it can be a pain. So all those little wheel hubs there, I'm going to chuck in this ultrasonic cleaner and run it up for 15 minutes. And uh, I've, that reminds me, that's disgusting, that cleaning solution in there. I've got to buy some fresh cleaning solution. I'll put that on the list. Anyway, whilst that's uh, buzzing away with its uh, ultrasonic cleaning action, I'm now going to strip the paint off of this uh, cabin and the two trailers. The poly stripper paint stripper gel works really well on this paint. As you can see, it just bubbles off. And once it's loosened, it's uh, quite easily to it's quite easy to remove using a toothbrush or something similar. I just did a little time lapse there to show you the paint blistering because it looks pretty cool. And I mustn't forget to do the base either, which I nearly did. So it only takes a couple of minutes, well maybe five minutes max, and you can remove the paint. This is what I do, I mean I have been doing it in my sink, but it gets a bit messy, so I thought I'd use a glass bowl of water here. And I've got the pink toothbrush, my old favourite. And I'm using that to agitate the paint and remove it from the model. Now after I've removed the paint, I give them a bit of a scrub with some soap and water to get all the paint stripper off. And then I buff them up with a couple of wire brushes and sometimes some bronze wool that I have. And it just kind of makes them look cleaner. In the process you can th see things like this where you remove a little scrap of paint that was hanging on. And it helps to sort of roughen up the body just a little bit. I mean, it shines it up, but it also makes microscopic marks on there. 
which helps the primer to stick. And that's what I'm doing now. I'm going to put on some of this Tamiya Fine Grey Primer. Now I've did this model and uh, the first time around I didn't prime the hoppers because I thought they're going to be silver anyway. Does it really need priming? Anyway, the paint didn't go on particularly well. So I ended up having to strip the hoppers a second time, undercoating them and then using my airbrush to paint them silver. You'll see in a minute that I should be doing that. The base here, I just used the pressure pack there of the satin black. It's really convenient because you don't have to mix up the paint and clean out your paintbrush if you just use it straight out of the can. So this is the Australian Export Silver Paint that I thought would do. It's, it's, I've used it in the past and it's a really good product but for some reason today this did not want to go on very well. It went on a bit lumpy, a bit rough and it, I mean it looks alright in that picture there but Overall, I was not impressed by the finish and that's why I decided I'm just going to have to strip it back and, and prime it and redo it with the air gun. So here's the cabin that's been freshly undercoated. I'm just looking at the, some of the details now. Most of the details on the front here with the radiator, the headlights, indicators, driving lights, whatever. And tiny little letters on the bonnet there, GMC, which I think stands for General Motors Company. Am I right? I think I am. On the left hand side there's a fuel tank and on the right hand side looks like maybe there's a couple of battery boxes or toolboxes. Not too sure. So uh, not a vast amount of detail but enough to be going on with. This is one of the early ones don't forget. Anyway these wheels now have come out of the ultrasonic cleaner and I'm just Putting them on some kitchen towel there to remove the cleaning fluid. And have a look at these. These come up absolutely beautiful. They're like brand new. I could not believe it. So that was a win. Now here's the windscreen that I removed. And you can see why now. Because over the years it's had a little bit of scuffing occur on it. I'm going to try this semi-chrome polish that came in a package the other week. And it's the first time I'm going to try it. And I'm a little bit worried it might make the windscreen go opaque. So to start off, I'm going to just try and polish up that suspension piece of green plastic there. And of course, if it goes opaque or melts, it won't matter because it's going to be hidden inside the model. So I'll just give it a quick rub over there with the cotton bud, as you can see, and buff it up. and uh, Have a look. It only took me a couple of minutes and... Uh, I was very impressed with that semi-chrome metal polish. It worked really well on this plastic. I thought, well, that's giving me the green light. I can go ahead and do the windscreen now. It's very therapeutic as well. That's what I like about this hobby. You can zone out. Doing something like this, you forget all your worries and, you know, just concentrating on one tiny little thing in the world and it's just really cool. So that came up pretty good, but the finishing touch is to dip it in some of this self-shining floor polish. It took me a while to find the right brand, but this is great. Long Life it's called. I don't know if you can get it in your neck of the woods. Obviously I live in Australia, so I bought mine in Australia. Now the thing with this is when you dunk it and pull it out, quite often as has happened here, there's air bubbles formed in the corners of the molding there. And you have to pierce them and shake off all the excess and make sure there's no air bubbles there. Because if you don't, when it dries, you'll see a seam of the edge of the bubble. I learnt the hard way about that. I've got this onion saver that I use and I just place the windscreen, the wet windscreen on a piece of kitchen towel. Put it in the onion saver and set it aside to dry. Back to these trailers again. Now I have painted them silver, stripped them back, and now I've undercoated them. And again, we can have a look at the details. A nice piece of checker plate detailing on the front of that drawbar. You can see how crisp the lines are in this casting. It's quite tactile to hold this thing, and, and it actually looks really good. It's just, I mean, these things are not, in real life are probably not very detailed. They are what they are. They're a bucket for putting sand in or whatever. So Matchbox did a really good job on replicating these. 
I decided to use my airbrush to paint them silver because the canned paint didn't work and I haven't really got much silver paint left. So this calls for a trip to my local hobby shop down in Werribee in Railway Avenue. They got a huge supply of paints in here, like thousands of dollars worth I reckon, and I'm just overwhelmed. But uh, eventually I find the Tamiya shelf and on the top there, one of my favourites, X11 the chrome silver that'll do me I ended up buying two pots because one never seems to last and uh, no sooner would you believe it I'm back home and I'm eager to get this thing painted so look at that that's a fresh pot but it's only actually half full it's amazing isn't it very extremely deceptive when you see those pots of paint on the shelf that they're actually only half full never mind I always give them a bit of a squirt of some thinners uh, it's not science, I don't use a measuring jug or anything, I just give them a little squirt and I use my intuition as to how much to put in there just to make it runny enough to go through my spray gun easily. Give it a bit of a whip up, check the viscosity there, looks good to me. And over to the spray booth, now here's my dual action airbrush. It's a no-name brand, it's got no markings on it whatsoever, so I'd love to tell you what brand it is, but I don't know. Anyway, it served me well, I am thinking of getting another one though soon. Don't ask me why, it's just that I've had this one so long, I, I feel like I should upgrade. Uh, but in all honesty, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, I think they're about $100 to buy from your local hobby shop. They are a major item if you're entering into this hobby, but... And you can get away with it by using some pressure packs, obviously not the silver in this, on this one, it didn't work, but you know, a few of them I've used pressure packs on and they've turned out fine. You would never know that you didn't have a air gun or a uh, airbrush. I use these magnetic clamps and they're normally pretty good, but this model is quite heavy. And I had to couple two together there to try and hold the handle of those forceps whilst it dried. Now for the cabin, and the tray and the mud guards on this truck. I'm using my one of my favorite paints, the Russet Red. I don't know why, Matchbox seem to do a lot of things in Russet Red. And this paint is as near as damn it as you're gonna get out of the pot. So uh, it's a popular one of mine. I, I, I always forget I've got it though. I, and I, if I'm in the hobby shop, I buy some just in case. And I think I might have about eight tins of this now, all sort of opened and half full or whatever. But look at that, this, this is about three coats. Beautifully glossy, the, the, the Tamiya acrylics, I, I just love them. I really get on well with them and I've got nothing but praise for that brand. They might be a little bit more pricey than the others, I don't know. Now, putting these wheels back together, I, get, I remember now that that one there is a bit dodgy, so again, I'm gonna be mindful of that one and make sure that when I put the double wheels on the axle, that one is going to go on the inside of the model. So it can't be seen from the casual observer looking at the model in a cabinet, for example. I actually thought I was one down. I hunted around and I remembered this one. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I panicked for a second there. Anyway, all good, they're all there. Chuck that bit of cardboard away, this one here is very dodgy it's got a split in it so once again that one is going on the inside also to conceal it now here's a little 12 volt electric motor I bought on eBay about a year ago and I've been meaning to use it and I finally got around to putting a power supply on it it's actually from a Sony laptop it's a little tiny 12 volt power supply and I just plugged it in tested the thing out and it worked so I'm going to be using it now for doing my axles when I've got axles to clean I'm showing you here using a little bit of wire wool, but I ended up using some fine emery paper in the end. I found that worked better. I think this might be 24 hours later and the windscreen is th thoroughly dry and the clear shine has set. And this looks like factory fresh, brand new windscreen. It is beautiful. And without it, the model would look unfinished. So it's, I'm glad I took the time to, you know, give it a bit of a polish and a, a dunk. Now I've just got to put it back in the model without breaking it. 
Um, I can't reform the rivet that I drilled out that was holding it in originally. So I've adopted this procedure these days where I use a tiny little blob of clear silicon. Uh, just enough to hold it in but not and not too much that when you press it down it splurges out of the edges which would be tragic because you know how messy this silicon can be so just press it home there and it, it sort of spreads out underneath the roof of the transparency and hopefully it will stay in there for the next 50 years and if somebody wants to restore it later on they should be able to pull that out without too much trouble I would think now I lost one of the axles can you believe it I didn't actually lose it but I, I tried loads of different combinations of putting them back together and none of them worked so I ended up having to uh, just find another long axle that one was extra long and I cut it down to suit so it may pay in the future if you're doing something like this to maybe label the axles so they go back in the same holes because uh, this model must be full of subtle differences in the dimensions of the axles and the, the chassis or whatever and it's like a jigsaw puzzle it has to be, go back together properly else it doesn't go back together anyway uh, got there in the end I used my drill press there with a nail punch in the end of it instead of my usual modified nail the nail punch is now going to be my standard practice because it it's just so much better the finisher on the head of the nail I mean when I showed you it there you probably noticed it's difficult to tell which one is the original factory end and which is the end that uh, I've reformed in my shed. Right, I just used a drift and a small hammer there to knock that spare wheel pin back into the model. That's not going anywhere soon. You can see these axle holes are elongated so the axle can ride up and down against this plastic spring and that's the suspension action that I mentioned before it's not that impressive but it's it sort of improves the play factor and makes it more realistic for the kid driving it around in the sand pit so I put my M2 screw back in and it's color matched because I put it in before I painted the the cabin so I always spray the screws underneath to color match the upper body because in the factory of course it was part of the upper body and they were actually the same color some people say we should paint it silver but I, I don't um, now that split pin is what was holding the truck and trailer together in the beginning when I first got it and it didn't look very good so I'm trying to replicate what's on the rear trailer there a nice silver rivet I found these nails in my shed and the head is very similar to the head of the rivet the original one so I'm going to try using one of these obviously they're a little bit long so I've cut one down and just did a little sort of a, a concept uh, before I painted the model I put this in and hammered it to see if I could hammer the end over and I could so I've extracted it and now I'm making another one and it's going to be slightly shorter than that one I just showed you because the one I showed you was slightly too long and with that rotary cutting wheel, the most used um, accessory on my Dremel, I think. It's a fantastic thing to have. I use it every day. And uh, I've just got the punch in the vise. And the head of the punch is resting against the vise so it can't go anywhere. And I've just very gently peened that over. And I put a blob of silver paint on it, actually. And it kind of mushrooms and looks, looks really sweet at the end, you'll see. This plastic hook to, to fit it back in, I didn't want to glue it, so I thought what I might do is heat up the plastic and make it soft. And if I plunge it in the hole and press it up against that back plate or that stop plate in there, it should deform the end of the plastic there and make it like a mushroom and hopefully it won't come back out. I don't want to melt it or burn it, so I'm very careful with the little torch there. And I just push it in and squish and sure enough as I planned it uh, expands because it's being pushed up against that little piece of metal and that's not going to come out anytime soon I just scrape with the knife there a little bit of flashing that was annoying me and uh, this model is almost finished except I've got to put some decals on it and paint the headlights 
and the front bumper bar as per the original model. Now this is the silver paint. Remember I said I bought two pots? This is the first pot that I opened and I had some paint left over that I'd thinned. So I tipped it back into this pot and I labelled it as thinned so I know in the future. And I just thought instead of using the silver ink like I normally do, I'll just use this thinned Tamiya silver chrome paint and see how it goes. And it went on pretty good. It was a little bit wishy-washy. But uh, I gave it a couple of coats. Took me time. I mean, I speeded this up, obviously, but I really took me time over this. And I used some magnifying glasses so I could see what I was doing up close. And uh, I'm happy with that, I guess you could say. Turned out quite sweet. Here's some decals that I printed on my printer at home onto some white backed decal paper that I bought online from eBay. And uh, it looks like the F's messed up, but it's not. It's a stylized F and that's how they were. I didn't like it myself because it looks like there's a flaw in the transfer. But unfortunately, I'm trying to make it look as original as possible. And as I said, that's what they look like. So that's what these trucks are getting. I downloaded this image off of the internet and used snipping tool to cut it out and just cleaned it up a little bit using PaintShop Pro. And uh, they turned out not too bad, all things considered. I um, mean, I don't have the world's best printer, but these ones were quite well defined, I thought. And they go on that lower horizontal bar uh, in the center of the bucket. And I can, I can see why they're missing, because they're right where your fingers go, where kids' fingers go to pick the model up. And I put them on there. And using this cotton bud, I just roll it from the center out. That two purposes, gets rid of the air and the water, and it doesn't move the decal or tear it. If you drag with a cotton bud or a toothpick, you run the risk of tearing the decal. They're very delicate. And just to set these in place because of where they are on the model, I thought I'd go the extra yard. I mean, I've had this stuff for about a year now. I hardly ever use it. It's some decal setting solution, and I thought this model will probably benefit from it. So I used it on this model. Right, here's a brief reminder of what we looked at in the beginning. The windscreen is notice, noticeably uh, scuffed up and the paint on the body of this thing is atrocious. It's obviously been well played with. The hubcaps were a little bit mucky, not too bad, but that pin was missing and that horrible rusty bent split pin was in its place. Well, this is what it looks like now. And I am so pleased with this model, a very simple model, but a very attractive addition to my collection. I've got three of these long twin lorries now, not this type, I've got two other types, and they look good in a set. So I'm really pleased that I took the time to do this one, and again, thank you to my subscribers that have sent me these models without whom I would not be able to do this video and all the other videos that I do. This has turned out so good, I thought I might take it down to the auction yard and uh, see what I can get for it. So uh, I've done my shoulder recently and I can't change gears. So Kevin has kindly volunteered to drive it down there for me and I'm going to follow him in my car. Righto, Kevin, you, you're sure you're right now with the, with the gears and that? Yeah? And you can reach the pedals okay? All right, you, uh, you take your time, all right? And uh, I'll be right behind you. I've just got a couple of things to do. Oh, hello. What, what's this? Looks like Kevin's pulled over. Oh, no. I hope he hasn't broken the truck. Oh, what's this for? What? No way. Kevin! Thanks for watching. Until next time. Goodbye.